So we are going back to Theodore Roosevelt now and uh, Roosevelt's style of progressivism. And when we left off, we were talking about Cuba as the ever faithful isle and how it finally revolted. We discussed the reconcentrados, the concentration camps that were there with Valeriano Weiler. And we talked about the fact that an amendment was put forth saying that when this war to free Cuba finally happened, Cuba could not be part of the United States. It had to be independent. As a result, the Spanish-American War, the war that was fought to free Cuba, was launched in the Philippines halfway around the world. Uh, <coughs> because we needed to get something out of the war. All right, so now we're... <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're actually going to get into Cuba and the more famous part of the war and get to know this guy, Theodore Roosevelt. That is a young Theodore Roosevelt right there. Kind of to give you a feel for this guy, Roosevelt was, uh, he was born a very sickly young man. He was not, not super healthy. Uh, and his father had put him on an exercise regime when he was young and he had become almost addicted to physical exercise, and he'd become a real man's man. He was a, a hunter and a boxer and a, a whatever you could do that was a manly sport, he did it. But the one thing he'd not gotten to do was test himself in combat. America hadn't been in a real war since 1865. Think about that, it had been 30 years since we'd been in a real war. So. When the Spanish-American War kicked off, young Theodore Roosevelt was a assistant secretary of the Navy. He was in a position where he, there was no reason why he should ever have to go to, uh, to war. But he resigned his position as assistant secretary of the Navy in order to join the volunteer army and lead troops in the battle. This is quite an accomplishment. Now, Theodore Roosevelt has no military experience. So when he takes troops into battle, he's kind of taking things from his perspective as, a, as an adventurer. And he recruits his own people. It's called Roosevelt's Rough Riders, okay? And, and by the way, he did pronounce his name Roosevelt. Uh, his cousin Franklin pronounced it Roosevelt, but, but he would have been Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, spelled the same, they just pronounced it different. So Roosevelt's Rough Riders. And what he asked for, he asked for cowboys, college athletes, police officers, frontiermen, uh, and especially single men. He did not want to take any married men into battle. And his reasoning behind this was he wanted a group of adventurers that had nothing to lose that were willing to go out and be like the Mongols riding the steps, just destroying everything. That was his goal with this. Um, and, and it worked. He got the strangest group of people you would ever, uh, you would ever have. Um, he had a, a professional uh, polo player in his, in, in his uh, group. He had uh, college boxers. He had lots of criminals in his, uh, in his Rough Riders. Uh, he had one member of the Internal Revenue Service that was a tax man. Uh, you know, it, it was just kind of a strange group of people that had volunteered. They trained them in San Antonio, Texas. <coughs> By the way, if you're ever there, I think I've told this story before. <coughs> I know I've told it before. I think I told it before in here. But if you're ever in, <coughs> guys, forgive me for this cough. If you're ever in San Antonio and you're standing at the Alamo, you don't know what the Alamo is, it's that big building that looks like a Taco Bell in downtown San Antonio, okay? So if you're staring at the Taco Bell looking building, the Mission, right to the right there's this beautiful old hotel. And if you go into there, uh, the Roosevelt Bar is downstairs. And that's the bar where Roosevelt had his offices when he trained his men. They've got a trophy case with all of his stuff in there, it's pretty cool. Uh, go check it out if you ever get a chance. But Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, they trained as cavalry. But when time comes to go to war, they end up going to Florida, and they're supposed to get on this, this ship, 
the ship and go over there and land at a place called Daiquiri. The problem is there wasn't enough room on the ship for the cavalry. So the horses got left behind, at least all of them except for Little Texas and a couple of others. Roosevelt took his horse. Uh, by the way, the Rough Riders ended up stealing a train in order to beat another unit there so they could get over to, uh, 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 to Cuba. They actually hijacked a train to get them there in front of the unit that was marching. They, uh, they land at, uh, at Daiquiri, march their way through, and at the Battle of San Juan Hill, the uh, Roosevelt's Rough Riders kind of win the day. Now, what I find interesting is the Rough Riders included a detachment of Buffalo soldiers. That's an all-black unit. In fact, it was the most decorated unit. It still remains the most decorated cavalry unit in the history of the United States. In July of 1898, they defeat a group of mostly Spanish, but a lot of German mercenaries as well, at San Juan Hill, and they have essentially ended the war and captured Cuba. Uh, on July 16th, Puerto Rico is captured, another last-ditch Spanish colony, and it's time to declare peace. So we've got this war that's happening. Here's a picture of it. Remember that guy Frederick Remington I told you was, was going, uh, the, the William Randolph Hearst sent to take pictures? This is one of the paintings that Frederick Remington did. The Rough Riders are the ones in the brown pants and the blue. They're, they're charging up San Juan Hill, and you can see Roosevelt there in Little Texas. Uh, kind, of a, kind of a quality picture of what was going on. So what do we do? We get to the top of the hill, and Theodore Roosevelt takes this picture. He has uh, Stephen Crane take a photo of him. Stephen Crane was the writer that had come along. Why would you take a picture like this? You've got to think a little bit pragmatically and a little like a politician here. There's a reason why Theodore Roosevelt took this picture. Roosevelt is 39 years old, almost 40, and he really wants to be president one day. And he needs to be the hero of this war. So he takes this picture with the intention of when he gets back, writing the history with himself as, 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 as the big hero. And he was a big hero. He, believe, me, believe me, he was fearless. The people that, that fought underneath him talked about how, how, uh, how dangerous he was and how fearless he was in combat. But look at the picture closely, and you'll notice there is something missing from it. You know, we, we don't always catch it immediately, so uh, let me show you the second picture that was taken there. And then I think it'll be obvious. There's the second picture that was taken at San Juan Hill. Do we see the difference now? These are all the black soldiers, the Buffalo soldiers. They were right there next to Theodore Roosevelt. But in Roosevelt's picture, they're not there. Why not? What do you think? It is racism, but it's a weird kind of racism because Theodore Roosevelt himself was very much against racism. When he becomes president, he's the very first president to host a black man in the White House. He wanted the credit. He wanted the credit, and he knew that if he put blacks in this picture, that he would lose votes later on. Okay? So he made the pragmatic decision of going, you know what? There's a lot of racist Americans. We're going to put this pic. We're going to put a whitewashed picture out, and he did. This is one of the most famous pictures of all time. But this is the most decorated unit of all time, and it was there. We never see it. Okay, one of those sad points of history. All right, so we fought this war. It's time for us to have a treaty, and 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 end it. And I know we fought that war real quick, and I apologize for that. But it's a survey class. You can take a whole semester on the Spanish-American War, okay? We, we did two slides on it, you know? Uh, but July of 1898, we forced Spain to sign the Treaty of Paris. Now look at what we made them sign. These are the stipulations. One, Spain must leave Cuba. Is that fair? Yeah. 
We fought this war to free Cuba. So I think that's fair. I have no problem with that. Number two, Puerto Rico goes to the United States. We get control of Puerto Rico. Is that fair? We captured it. Hmm. How did Puerto Rico get involved in a war to free Cuba? Well, because Spain owned it too. So I don't know if that's fair, but I'll say this. American lives were put at risk to capture Puerto Rico. So maybe that's fair. Three, all of the Spanish islands that they owned between Hawaii and the Philippines will go to the United States. All of them. They had a bunch of these little bitty islands they controlled. We took all of them. Refueling stations. What do you think? Was that fair? We hadn't even touched those islands in the war. There were no Americans on them. But we said, you're going to give those to us too. And finally, the fourth. While we did not take the Philippines, the Philippines were an independent country, we continued to hold control of Manila indefinitely. By the way, we hold Manila all the way up through World War II. Okay? By the way, one of the things that we got into during World War II, we fought a big war in the Philippines because of this in World War II. Japan comes in and takes it over, and that makes us mad because, dang it, we're supposed to be the ones to take it over. All right, so did America start acting like an imperial power after this? I think they did. I think that is a fair statement. Now, here's the next thing. Cuba is free, right? That was a that was a guarantee. But look at how, how we freed Cuba. Tyler, let's read this Platt Amendment and, 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 because you'll be interested in this. We freed Cuba, but we put this amendment in their constitution. We wrote their constitution. And it says in there that the U.S. has, quote, the right to intervene for the preservation of Cuban independence, the maintenance of a government adequate for the protection of life, property, and individual liberty. What does that mean? It means, yes, you're free, but... If you, your government does something that we don't like, if you intervene in life, liberty, or property, or life, liberty, and individual liberty, uh, what does it say? Life, property, individual liberty. If you intervene in any of those, we have the right to go in and overthrow your government and put the U.S. on it. We still have that? Well, kind of. Uh, we don't have, we don't have that in place anymore because we supported uh, the new government later on, but we did keep, we kept Guantanamo Bay forever. And that's why we've kept it is because of this. And so we have the right to go in and, and intervene, intervene anytime they do something we don't like. So ever since 1898, we've owned Gitmo, a large a, a, a naval base on Cuba. The Cuban government has been trying to get us off it since 1959. We, we aren't going anywhere. Uh, I think maybe we should, but we're not. Huh? Obama did promise to close Gitmo. And, uh, and then he discovered that if he closes Gitmo, all of those prisoners have to come here. And uh, we'd rather have them on Cuba than here. So, uh, yeah. Could we trade Cuba for California? Yes. That would be a good idea. All right. So the Treaty of Paris. What do you think? Good treaty, bad treaty? Anybody? Well, it does. It was good for us. Was it fair? No. no. Absolutely not fair. Absolutely not fair. All right. I love this quote, and I put it up here. Uh, you won't have to memorize it or anything else. But I think it's important to show that there were Americans that saw what was happening. They understood that what the United States was doing was really un-American. Remember, we're a nation that was built on the principle of uh, democracy and popular sovereignty and personal liberty. But this was written by Mark Twain, the famous author, Samuel Clemens. He was, uh, <laughs> he was the president of the Anti-Imperialist League. And I like this, okay? I have read carefully the Treaty of Paris, and I have seen that we do not intend to free, but to subjugate the people of the Philippines. We have gone there to conquer, not to redeem. 
It should, it seems to me, be our pleasure and duty to make those people free and let them deal with their own domestic questions in their own way. And so I am an anti-imperialist. I am opposed to having the eagle put its talons on any other land. That is beautiful to me. It's a, very much an explanation of the idea of non-intervention <coughs> and neutrality and letting people take care of themselves. And that was in 1899. Okay? Could those words still ring true today? There are a lot of people in the world, a growing number of people in the world, that are non-interventionists that love those words, whether they know it or not. If they heard those words today, they would jump on it. Um, I'm, I'm in that category. All right, so the Spanish-American War changed America in a lot of ways. America <coughs> comes out of the Spanish-American War a vastly different nation. To me, you know, I like to describe things in terms of biology, and I always say, you know, that, uh, you know, the colonial period is like our preteen period, and then the revolutionary period is our rebellious teenager years, and you got your Jacksonian America, the Civil War is your crazy 20s. Well, to me, this is when America comes of age. This is when America went, you know, I'm an adult now. Uh, I, 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 I've got to have responsibilities. Uh, and the other side is, I'm an adult now and I don't care about other people's, uh, people's needs so much. So what do we do? We became more like European countries. We became an imperial power. Uh, that, that again is something vastly different. Next, and I think this is important. By the way, this would make a great essay on your next test. Um, I, I don't know that it'll be on it. It has been before on many occasions. Uh, so you want you to pay attention to this. The nation is no longer a republic equal in its parts. Now, what do I mean by that? In the past, every time we added a new territory to the United States, we had added it with the intention of it one day becoming a state. But now, we added Puerto Rico, and one of those islands we added was Guam. We also added the Marshall Islands. We added all these islands and Puerto Rico with, without the intention of it ever becoming a state. Still today, this was 1898, still today, <coughs> over a hundred years later, Puerto Rico is not a state. Guam is not a state. You know how long it took Texas to become a state? It was never a territory. The U.S. added it and went, state, immediately. We're a hundred years later. And by the way, Puerto Rico has more people in it than Texas did when it became a state. Why am I harping on this? Because there's got to be a reason why. And the biggest reason that I can see, now again, it's my opinion, the biggest reason I can see for it is that in the other places we had white men moving in and creating a large majority of the population. While here, the population was largely brown people. It was largely people of Indian and Spanish descent. And frankly, the racism of the era said that we can't trust brown people with statehood. So why don't we have it today? Well, I don't know. There's Nobody wants to put a 51st star on the flag. Uh, I, I would trade a couple of states for Puerto Rico personally. I don't know if y'all are aware of this or not, but the people of Puerto Rico, they pay all the taxes of a U.S. citizen. They have to follow all the laws of the U.S. citizenship, but they have no voice in Congress and they don't get to vote for president. Um, it's, it's a shame, it really is. And they're second only to Texas in the number of people they put in the military. Little Puerto Rico is second to Texas in the number of people it puts in the military. That should be enough. That should, uh, 
that should tell you something. Uh, so, no longer a republic equal in its parts. The next is there's some psychological effects of this. And it, it is both fatal and optimistic. Now, fatalism in psychology uh, doesn't mean, fatal doesn't mean death. It means unavoidable. That it means history or history is fatal. It's something that, that you can't get, can't get around. And people started seeing the world as it is necessary for us to uh, uh, expand. It is not only possible or probable, but it is the United States' duty to expand and, uh, and conquer other places. And we also started seeing the, the future as optimistic, as look, progress is possible. Yes, we're conquering these places, but we're bringing democracy to them. Uh, I always think of George Carlin, uh, the, the comedian, talking about, about America involving in foreign countries. He always said that, that democracy is nice, but democracy is kind of like putting lifts in your shoes. It helps you walk straight if you need it, but let's not go nail our, nail our shoes on, on other people's feet. Okay? That's kind of what we're doing with democracy. All right. So this map is kind of important to me. I'm going to show you how involved we got. Because I pointed out that we became an imperial power. So let's just look at the places that we annexed or made territories during this period. The U.S. All of those places that you see on there. Uh, Nicaragua, Panama, Cuba, Haiti. Uh, we, we're, we're intervening in all of these places. Our trading partners are literally all over the world. You've got this map. You don't have to have all this. Uh, we are literally everywhere. We are annexing places. We are annexing uh, the, 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 the Philippines, parts of the Philippines. We're annexing Guam. We're intervening in, in Panama. We are literally everywhere around the world. All right, so what do we know about this guy, Theodore Roosevelt? Up to this point, all we've really seen is Roosevelt as a soldier. But this guy did everything. You want to talk about a cool man in history. And I by no means love everything he did. Uh, he strengthened the office of the president dramatically. And I'm not crazy about that. But. He was a man that was driven by his own personality. Uh, he was a trained historian. Guys, when he was 19 years old, he wrote a history of naval warfare in the War of 1812. It was the standard book all the way up until the 1960s. If you were in college, you would have read Theodore Roosevelt's book. And he wrote when he was 19, okay? So he was a trained historian. He was a naturalist. What that means is he did want to protect the environment. Uh, the Democratic Party loves Theodore Roosevelt for this. He's the guy that founded the national park system. Uh, I like to poke the, my liberal friends with sticks for this because I always tell them, yes, he founded the national parks and he wanted to preserve the environment, but he did it because he wanted to kill lots of animals in them. Okay, He was an avid hunter, uh, very big hunter. There's a story about him when he was uh, he went bear hunting. He'd never he'd never shot a bear before. He'd shot moose and elk and everything else, but he'd never got a bear. So he'd gone on a on this this bear hunt. This is when he was vice president a little later on. But uh, he has a guide out there with him, and according to the story, the bugle went off. And what they did is when they when they found a bear, they would hit the bugle, and Roosevelt would come running to to, to catch it, to kind of hunt it down. Well, the bugle goes off. We found a bear, and they said he came running through there. And this guy had captured this bear, and it was a bear cub, and it was sickly, and the skin was loose, and it was it was sickly enough that they had captured it, and they had it tied off to a tree. And, uh, and and Roosevelt was supposed to come in there and shoot it, and Roosevelt let the bear go. He said there was no sport in killing that. Well, the story got around about Roosevelt not being willing to kill this uh, this sickly bear. And people started making fun of him, and they started drawing cartoons of Roosevelt as a bear, and they called them teddy bears. Okay? Well, a 
a, a manufacturing company out of New York had all of these bears that they had made uh, that they couldn't give away. Nobody wanted them. So what did they do? They dressed them in a uh, they dressed them in a vest like Roosevelt always wore, stuck a monocle on its ear, and sold them as teddy bears. And he, they, they became incredibly rich for it. So if you had a teddy bear when you were a kid, it's actually named after Teddy Roosevelt. Okay. Uh, he was a cowboy. His first wife dies uh, very very young. In fact, he had probably the worst day any man's ever had in his life. His mother and his wife died on the same day. Uh, they, uh, they, had, they, they had the same disease. They, a highly contagious, uh, we don't really know what it was, but probably something like the flu. Highly contagious, and they, they both died on the same day. And uh, Roosevelt leaves his children with his sister and goes out and lives in the Dakota Territory. It wasn't a state yet, but it, what's today North Dakota and he buys a, a, a cattle ranch up there and tests himself in the badlands of the Dakotas as a uh, as a rancher he's uh, he's fairly successful for a little while although the hard winter wipes out a lot of his herd there uh, there's a story that went around about him when he was a cowboy that a guy called him four eyes one time because of his glasses and he thrashed him nearly to death with a piece, with a piece of, of, of timber, uh, you know, whatever it was. Literally yanked him out of his off his bar stool and thrashed him until he was almost dead. That is Theodore Roosevelt for you. Uh, we've already seen him as a soldier. After he got back from the Spanish-American War, he goes to New York. He's the big hero, and he's made commissioner of police. Now, New York had several commissioners. They're the politicians that run the police department. They are not cops. Their job is to run the department. But Roosevelt was not satisfied with just running the department. Instead, Roosevelt himself picked the most dangerous beat in New York, and he walked it himself. So this police commissioner chose to walk a beat. That shows you the kind of guy he was. Uh, he gets promoted to assistant secretary of the Navy and eventually uh, governor of New York City. Now, as governor of New York, Theodore Roosevelt enforces the rules so strictly that the big businessmen there uh, want to get rid of him because he starts breaking up trusts. He doesn't let them sell products on Sunday. He's breaking up all of these rules. So what do you do? If you want to get rid of a, a governor, there's three things you can do. And really only three. You can shoot them. You can impeach them. Or you can promote them. Short of an election, that's what you can do. Well, I don't want to be the person that shoot, tries to shoot Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, when he runs for president, he gets shot in the chest uh, by an attempted assassin, and he continues to give an hour and a half speech before he goes to the hospital. I don't want to be the guy to try and shoot him. He hasn't done anything to really get impeached for, so that leaves us with promote. Well, what do you promote somebody to from governor? Well, there was a pretty popular president running for re-election. So that's not a good one. So what they did was they convinced in 1900, they convinced President William McKinley to dump his vice president and pick Theodore Roosevelt this time. So Roosevelt gets promoted to vice president. Now what I think is funny is they made him vice president because he was so damaging as governor to, to business. They wanted him somewhere where he was harmless, so they made him vice president. Now, guys, does the vice president have any real authority? Anybody got any ideas? No. The only authority the vice president really has is he gets to cast the deciding vote in the event of a tie in the Senate, and he can be the presiding officer in the Senate if he wants to be. Okay? That's his power. Other than that, he has no real authority. 
Well, seems like a good place to store it. And remember, at this time period, vice presidents almost never became president. They usually didn't, that was not the natural stepping stone. Secretary, Secretary of State was the natural stepping, or a senator, either the senator or Secretary of State. Uh, vice president was kind of considered a place to put somebody to die, okay? And Roosevelt was only 41 years old when he was made vice president. That's young. So, what's going to happen? Well, the young man, now 42, he turned 42 very quickly, gets a, decides to go on a hunting trip. Well, he gets a telegram, he gets a message on his hunting trip that you need to rush back to New York, to the World's Fair in New York, because President McKinley has been shot. This guy on the left, Leon Shulgaz, he was an anarchist. And he stood in line for hours to meet the president. And as he got up to shake the president's hand, he shook the president's hand with one hand and shot him with the other. McKinley holds on for a few days. Roosevelt is called, you've got to get back here. And Roosevelt is stuck up in the mountains out in the middle of nowhere with no way to get back. So they tell the story that how he got back, there's nothing, he, uh, he, he has a buck, he, he builds a buckboard wagon, which is this basically this, this piece of wood that you strap behind a horse and you sit on the wood and just let the horse drag you. And that's how he gets down to the bottom. And then he gets down to the train and there's no train on the way. So he gets on a hand cart. Y'all seen the old cartoons where the guys are pumping the hand cart on the train? That's literally what he got on and he rides that one to the next terminal. And then he gets on a train and makes his way back to, uh, to Buffalo, New York. When he gets there, he finds that the president has died. And he's got to be sworn in. He's in his frontier outfit. What are you gonna do? Well, he borrows a suit from a local undertaker. Uh, I don't even wanna know where the suit came from, but he borrows it from an undertaker, gets sworn in, and for the third time in history, a vice president has been raised to the office of president because of assassination. Three times now. What's the great irony here? Remember, as governor, he was doing so much damage to business that they promoted him to vice president to get him out of the way. Well, now he's president. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to go after big business. They screwed up. They let the lion loose. And Roosevelt is the youngest man. By the way, he still remains the youngest man ever to become president at 42 years old. Okay? Uh, he's not the youngest elected. The youngest elected was John F. Kennedy. Uh, but he's the youngest to become president. Kennedy was 42. Roosevelt was 42. Um, yeah, those are the two youngest. And Clinton was like 43. He was right there with him. All right, I'm going to show you some pictures here, and I want to talk about them because they're all uh, editorial cartoons from the time period. And honestly, Star Test likes to use editorial cartoons. And I do too. I think they're, they're a great way to, to teach about it. And I kind of want you to look at these and be trying to figure out, is there bias in it? Remember, bias is... Uh, does it, does it have a point of view? And is it historically accurate? All right, so here's the first one. I love this one. Theodore Roosevelt is leading his Rough Riders into battle. But if you look down there at the bottom, the Spanish, Spanish always wore their white, their white uniforms. And they look very, very small. So the message the artist is trying to say here is that Roosevelt is larger than life. The Americans were bigger, they were tougher than the Spanish. Is there bias in this? Yes. Absolutely. Lots of bias. This is from an American perspective, okay? Uh, think it's an accurate depiction of Roosevelt? I think it's an accurate depiction of what Americans thought Roosevelt was, okay? Here's one that's not quite so positive about Roosevelt. 
Uh, I like it. It looks like a famous painting y'all may have seen before. Mm -hmm. You may have seen one on the back of a of an old 1976 Porter where it's got the guys uh, with marching and all. Well, that's what this picture is. It's it was originally supposed to be three Revolutionary War heroes, but in this one, all the Revolutionary War heroes have been replaced with Theodore Roosevelt. But Roosevelt doesn't look nearly as attractive and tough in this one. He looks kind of goofy, doesn't he? Well, the artist in this one is kind of trying to say that Roosevelt is founding America again. He's starting it over. He's redoing all this. Uh, and maybe not in a good way. And then there's my absolute favorite one. This is the one that makes me want to, uh, to, to, to vote for Roosevelt. <clears throat> I would dig him up and vote for him just for this. How tough was Roosevelt? They have him drawn as a boxer. I don't know if y'all can read it or not, but the other side is a sign there and it says Democrats Corner and there's nobody in it. What's the artist trying to say? Nobody's big enough to stand up against him. Yeah, nobody's big enough to take on Roosevelt. He's bigger than life, okay? Uh, and I think that's an accurate depiction of Theodore Roosevelt. He was bigger than life. Is that an American flag tank top he's wearing there? No, I don't think so. Oh. They wouldn't have done that back then. Uh, that would have been considered a very bad tank. Oh. Uh, I think it probably still is. Yeah. All right, so what is Roosevelt's policy going to be? Now we have this guy, this, this rough rider as our president. Theodore Roosevelt believes in order and efficiency over everything else. He wants a government that is quick, powerful, and efficient. As a result of that, he likes a powerful president. He likes the idea of a president as what he would have called a bully pulpit. Now, here's the situation that we have, we have a problem with. Roosevelt used the word bully a lot. And today, bully means something else. Uh, bully back then meant... Uh, it didn't really mean good, but it meant powerful, strong, okay? So by calling it a bully pulpit, he was saying the president has this power to speak directly to the people, and, and it's a powerful, powerful uh, thing to have. He believed in a competitive business environment. As a result, he believes that all trusts and mon monopolies should be broken up and also believed in a national government that was incredibly powerful at the expense of the state. He did not believe, he was not a federalist. He did not believe in strong states. He very much believed that power should be centered in the national government and in the president and the president should be making the decisions. He had a lot of faith and power, and you should expect that from a guy that went off and was a cowboy and a soldier and all this. His favorite saying, he brought it back from Africa with him, walk softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. What do you think that means? Walk softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. Boy, I'm talking to myself here. What do you think walk softly and carry a big stick means? It sounds literal to me. It's it does. Kind of, it's kind it of like take, uh, take no bull but do no harm. Yeah, there you go. He's saying, look, don't pick a fight. Don't go out and pick a fight. But if a fight comes your way, win it. Okay? And that's, that's literally his logic there. Uh, as a result, he uses the military in order to negotiate. He uses force what we called gunboat diplomacy, or sometimes called big stick diplomacy. Uh, the idea of, I'm gonna force the nations of the world to do what I want them to do by parking my gunboats outside their capital. And either you, you sign the treaty or you get to see how effective my, my military is. The threat of the military is incredibly important to it. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. How important was it? Theodore Roosevelt built the largest navy the world had ever seen. Remember, he read Alfred Thayer Mahan's book, too. 
And he also was a historian of the Navy. He had been assistant secretary. He loves the Navy. He's got a special part, special spot for it. This is a picture of it, and I wish it was in color so you could see it. Because he didn't just build the largest all-steel steam-powered Navy in the world. He painted it bright white. And he called it his great white fleet. <coughs> And in 1907, he sent it around the world to port at all the major ports. Why would you do that? Let everybody know you had it. I want the whole world to know what I've got. This is the beginning of America as a superpower. This is what we have. We have the biggest Navy in the world. I dare you to argue with me. What do y'all think of that? I like it. I like him a lot. Do I agree with him? Not entirely, but I can respect the fact that he's unapologetic about it, okay? He's unapologetic about his use of force. I believe I'm right, and I'm willing to put my, my money where my mouth is, okay? Let's talk about Roosevelt in the Russo-Japanese War. This was literally a civil, well, not a civil, a war between Russia and Japan that Theodore Roosevelt stuck himself right in the middle of. What had happened was there's this chunk of land called the Kamchatka Peninsula. If you look at a world map, if you look where Japan is and Russia is, there's this little peninsula that comes down right above Japan. This is a spot of land that had been controlled by Russia at some times and Japan at some times, China at some times. It had never really been, been set as to who was going to control it. And both Japan and Russia won it. And Russia has not had a real victory in a generation. And in order to stay powerful and dominant, it really needs a victory. Japan is an overpopulated island and needs room to grow. So what does Roosevelt do? Roosevelt looks at the world, and this is Roosevelt as a pragmatist and uh, very much a Byzantine kind of sneaky creature. He was smart. He looked at the world, and we're talking about way back here in 1905, Roosevelt said that the two big threats of the 20th century are going to be Russia and Japan. That was in 1905, both of which were not threats at that point. But he said, within this century, Russia and Japan will be the two biggest threats to the United States. Was he right? Yeah. I forgot about Germany, but Russia and Japan. He calls it 1905. So what does he do? He gets sneaky. He goes to Russia and he goes, hey, listen, uh, I think Japan wants your land. I, uh, I wouldn't put up with that if I were you. I would move some military there. So Russia, yeah, so Russia takes it and moves its military to the Kamchatka Peninsula as a show of force. And then he goes across to Japan and he goes, I don't know what those crazy Russians are doing, but they moved their military up here next to you. I'd watch out if I were you. So Japan built their military up. And he egged them on until they got into a war. <laughs> and they get into, we actually financed part of the Japanese war effort. We gave them money for this. So they get into the war. And they fight each other, and Japan wins the war. Japan defeats the Russians at a heavy cost. Most of their military was destroyed. At the end of the war, both sides want to claim or, or, or want to end this. So they go to Theodore Roosevelt and they ask him to negotiate the peace treaty. The guy that started the war, they ask him to negotiate. So Roosevelt calls him to his house in New Hampshire, outside of Oyster Bay, and literally while sitting on the bay, he's got the Japanese Prime Minister and the Ambassador from Russia sitting on his porch, and out in the harbor where they can see it, he has his great white fleet doing maneuvers, moving back and forth. So the whole time the negotiation is going on, Roosevelt's standing over these two guys, and his Navy ships are going back and forth in front of them. And he says, you're going to sign this peace treaty. And they signed it. Now, here's the deal. When it went over, Japan gave back all the land they took from Russia. And Russia went home. It was just like the war had never happened. Except 
both nations were greatly weakened by, by fighting this war. Was it smart what Roosevelt did? For us, he probably put those two nations emerging as a world power back a generation. Okay? This is the part that I find ironic. Theodore Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating an end of the Russo-Japanese War. Even though he's the guy that picked the start of the fight to begin with. He's one of only three presidents to win the Nobel Peace Prize. So, who's your third? Obama and Bill Clinton. Okay. Obama? Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know about you.